former top aide to Vice President Mike Pence before resigning in August of 2020. Libby is now the director of the Republican Accountability Project and a frequent guest. Good to see you again, my friend. So the January 6th committee, it is looking at members of Pence's inner circle. And one of them, Pence's former national security advisor, Keith Kellogg, was subpoenaed by the committee on Tuesday. The others include former chief counsel Greg Jacob, former chief of staff Mark Short. So what might these people in Pence's inner circle know that they could provide to the committee? And does it tell you anything about where the investigation's heading? Yeah, well, first, I think, you know, these are three individuals in the very inner circle. Um, Kellogg, also very, very loyal to Trump himself. And I think for Kellogg, I think the telling thing will be whether he'll remember his oath to the Constitution as a military officer and tell the truth about what happened in the lead up to January 6th whether he was aware of any of the planning for the rally, what were the dynamics that were being warned about. And then as it plays out that day, from it's my understanding that he was in the Oval that day, what happens when the vice president is in the Capitol? What is the back and forth going on with the president and the vice president's staff? Now for the other people on the staff, I think I'd be, I'd be interested in asking the questions on, you know, Mike Pence put out this statement before he gets in the motorcade to head to the Capitol. And it's a very public statement saying, you know, I'm about to head to the Capitol and do my duty, my constitutional duty. There's nothing else I can do. So what what was the lead up to putting that statement? Why did they feel the need to put that statement out, a statement that's rare? You don't really see a vice president making an announcement like that. Mm -hmm. And then what were the events of that day that they witnessed on the delays? What was the president doing? Was, was there interaction between the staffs, which we're familiar with, what has been reported that there was, but the Daryl election of duty by the sitting president at the time is just... Mm -hmm astonishing and horrifying. And so we've got to get to the bottom of this. I think this will be a critical part. So you describe Keith Kellogg as being, I guess, a Trump acolyte in short. How about other Pence people? Will they cooperate with the committee? Are they a different crew than Trump's inner circle? They are indeed a different crew. I will say that I know plenty of people who worked on uh, Mike Pence's staff who would have never worked on the other side of the White House, huh. so to speak. And uh, look, I, I, you know, Greg Jacob, I think he is a man of integrity. I hope that he will cooperate and tell the truth. I think he, out of anyone in this group, really understands what was happening there. And there's been some interactions that have been reported about what he did that day and the pushback that he faced uh, dealing with people like John Eastman. Mark Short, I think that is a very different question. I, I'm very familiar with Mark Short and his demeanor and what he tends to do. I've often questioned his loyalty for, for who he was actually working for. So I think, but I'm hopeful that they will describe what it was like that day and cooperate because it's important for history. It's important for the future of our country. It's important to get the information out there um, in a matter, you know, that is critical to this investigation mm -hmm. on the January 6th committee for many yeah. reasons, including yeah. for our national security. And, and, and listen, I want to make the point again to reiterate that Keith Kellogg's been subpoenaed, uh, Jacobs in short, not yet. Uh, they're certainly being looked Correct. at is what we understand. Okay, so uh, Steve Bannon, we know he's been indicted by a federal grand jury for contempt of Congress. So what's the message that'll be sent to the other Trump aides that have been served? Let's talk about Mark Miller, I'm rather Mark Meadows, Stephen Miller, both of them. Um, how do you suspect they respond to this? Do you think it gets him to cooperate or try stalling as Ban Bannon did, you know, unsuccessfully. I mean, he's definitely been charged, at least at this point, whether he cooperates going forward. We'll see. Yeah, I think it could go either way, but I do think that these are uh, the loyalist, the truest of the most devout, and I think that they are going to stall. They have mm -hmm. done this repeatedly in the past, facing situations where they're undermining the rule of law, but yet they're using the rule of law and the courts sort of stall the process and wait, wait it out. And so I think that if they can sort of slow roll this along the way and hope that they regain power in the midterms and that this stalls and waits till then, then I think that is their plan all along. Do they, are they doing that stall to protect themselves or to protect Donald Trump or is it both? You know, I think it's a mix of both. I think you know they have decided that they are loyal to this one individual at whatever cost. And I think mm -hmm. what other choice do they have now? They've gone all in with this individual. And I think that they're hoping, you know, given that Trump is still out there in political circles, he still has a lot of sway in the Republican Party. It is the Trump, the party of Trump right now. And that he, you know, he's still threatening to run in 2024. And yeah. so I think all of these people think 
you know, this is, these are the coattails we've decided to ride, unfortunately. Yeah. So as we watch all this pressure for loyalty within Trump world, I mean, it's still playing out before our eyes. You had a bizarre experience while working in the Trump administration. You were listening to a Taylor Swift song. So what happened? Well, it goes to show um, there was a lot of loyalty tests within. Uh, you had to show extreme loyalty to be working in this uh, administration or around it. And so they would do social media checks. They would, you know, kind of be paying attention to your actions or what we were interacting with. And that day I was listening to Taylor Swift. I, I am a fan of hers and I was listening to your music that one night and I did have a colleague come by and he, you know, was playing it very loud. It was late, it was like 10 o'clock at night. I was really angry after a meeting that day on the COVID pandemic. And I was told that I might want to consider turning that down that, you know, listening to Taylor Swift wasn't going to buy me any favors. And at the time I, I kind of chuckled while I did slowly turn it down. But, you know, I was thinking about this the other day and I had a Taylor Swift phone cover and, you know, subconsciously, I guess along the way, I remember that moment where I switched it out because I realized that anything you did would be calling into question your capability. They would, it would undermine your work possibly, which is, it sounds trivial and it sounds insane that I'm saying this as an American living in the free country of the United States that I should be concerned about the music that I listen to, but this is what it was. I bet you Taylor Swift will take this whole story as a badge of honor for her. But let me move on to another thing here. The new Department of Homeland Security bulletin, which says domestic extremists are threatening violence against Congress, against school, against health officials. This bulletin also reveals that foreign terrorists and domestic racists are exploiting the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. DHS is warning that bad actors are influencing online forums, trying to spread violent narratives. Olivia, how persistent are threats like this and how can the U.S. combat them? Well, it's really concerning right now because not only do we have domestic threats happening, we have the congruence of foreign adversaries that are exploiting the current divisiveness in our country that are exploiting these types of scenarios uh, that are happening. And you know, that bulletin, it's, it's real. The threat is real. We're seeing this increasing on a daily basis. And unfortunately, we have elected leaders who are enabling the rise of this threat by their rhetoric and their behavior and their demeanor. People watch this, they watch this and certain networks that cover it, and they push these narratives, and it's dangerous. And I don't see this fading anytime soon. And I'll, I'll point to the fact that uh, this past week, there was a letter that I signed on to with nearly 100 other national security officials talking about the threats of misinformation, disinformation that are happening here in our country that are undermining our electoral system. And we're very concerned. We remain very concerned about the future of our democracy. We remain concerned about the, th the threats to election officials, to poll workers, and uh, what this means for the future right now. Mm -hmm. Our conversations are always sobering, but very necessary. Olivia Troy, thank you for coming on again. Good to see you. Also today, some new developments in the fight against COVID.